All right, everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and for today's video masterclass, we're going to be talking about um, a new addition to Adobe Stock and all of the various stock offerings that you have available to you, specifically when using the video apps. So Premiere Pro, After Effects, theoretically Audition, although I guess it integrates in some way with Adobe Stock. And then along the way, also talking about CC libraries. And with the inclusion of audio now as part of Adobe Stock, there's also an audio component to libraries in addition to the things that we were already using with video, things like graphics and vectors coming from mobile apps like Adobe Capture CC, as well as the ability to work with images and, of course, uh, stock video and motion graphics templates, whether you've downloaded them or, or, or uh, licensed them from Adobe Stock or created them yourself in Premiere Pro or in After Effects. So as always, we're coming to you live on Behance, YouTube, and Twitter Periscope. If you want to follow the conversation, that is happening over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. So I know we've got a lot of you over on YouTube as well. So thank you so much. What's up, Wade? What's up, Kraft? Fo My Life, how are you doing? Desiree Ajay, how's it going? Dr. Jekyll Hyde, Bob Demers from Smoky Tucson. Oh yeah, man, we've got some serious fires going on in Arizona, don't we? Jane Bradbury, Kamal, how's it going? Anthony, TGIF, yes indeed. <laughs> and for us, it's a bit of a in a, in a holiday weekend because we have our annual company shutdown next week. So we will not be, I will not be streaming next week. Um, although I may be doing some other streams randomly because uh, my birthday happens to be over the weekend. So I was thinking maybe doing something next week. I don't know, very, very different on my channels. We shall see if I get inspired. If nothing else, I'm going to be retooling the studio next week. So when I come back in a week and a half or so, well, this camera angle probably won't look very different, but this angle, whichever, wherever that one is, oh, I don't even have it stored on here. Uh, this angle, <laughs> this angle is gonna look a little bit different. I'm planning to bring all those keyboards forward, bring the other keyboards that you can't see closer this way, do a full on surround 70s Stevie Wonder style keyboard setup so that I can do live composition and other things and just kind of change things around. It's been like this for about three years. I, I need a change. So with that, let's go ahead and a uh, couple other hellos here. What's up, Sean Meyer and Paloma. <laughs> Thank you very much. Chris Thomas, Stephen Underwood, Marwane, Volwell, Cal, how's it going? Got your message, I'll respond to that later. All right, very cool. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, switch over. Elier Dov, you got contact to work with Premiere, very nice, glad to hear it. Yes, I'll be doing some contact recording this weekend. Maybe some tracks, new tracks for my birthday, could be, you never know. We'll see uh, how inspiration drives me. So, okay, let's go ahead and switch things over here and get right into Premiere and talk about the first a uh, new addition to Premiere Pro and the Adobe Stock family, which is the inclusion of stock audio. So as of June 16th, just a few short weeks ago, uh, we announced that Adobe Stock now has audio thanks to two of our very popular YouTube partners. You'll know them if you create videos for YouTube, most likely, Epidemic Sound and Jamendo. Of course, people use these uh, soundtracks outside of YouTube as well, all over the place. Really great uh, production music content, and we're really happy to have all of these. And we're adding new stuff every day. So you can see right now, with no filters implemented, you have uh, approximately 36,000 soundtracks available to you to preview and license directly inside of Premiere Pro and use with the content that you're working with. Um, there's some really amazing stuff in here. And what I really love about the integration of this panel is we kept it kind of in the exact same spirit as motion graphics template access via the essential graphics panel. So that's kind of the first key starting point is if you're looking for like, hey, where's the stock audio stuff? I saw it, but I went to the window menu and I didn't see stock audio because <laughs> it makes sense that you might see that the way we've been talking about it. Actually, again, in the spirit of how we integrated motion graphics templates from Adobe Stock into the Essential Graphics panel. Um, Adobe Stock Audio can be found, why are these things turning on? In the Essential Sound panel under the Browse tab. So again, your default look for Essential Sound is this, okay? And then if we go into Browse, now you'll see we have access to Adobe Stock. Essential Graphics, uh, 
it's funny. It's actually backwards. I'm noticing that right now. <laughs> and it makes sense because you're editing the, the essential graphics, but browsing for content. Here, you're editing your essential sound tagged audio, but you're browsing for music content. Kind of funny, actually. So in Essential Graphics, it's under the Browse tab, and you'll see we have a specific Adobe Stock button here. And when you click on that, this is going to allow you to search through all the many, many thousands and thousands of motion graphics. So we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. All right. Uh, Marwane, will we buy every stock individually or as a subscription? No, no, no. So as you're as a, a CC member, you know, um, you you purchase credits just like you do for purchased. Uh, images or purchase vectors or purchase 3D objects, you purchase credits and then you license them that way. So the licensing model is not very different if you've already used Adobe Stock for other content. Um, it's fairly inexpensive as well. So compared to like Mogurts, which, you know, we've heard from some are a little pricey. The standard price is $19.99 for a Mogurt. Um, it's a bit cheaper for audio. And uh, again, you just have so many options available to you. And what's really nice too, if you're just trying to temp music, uh, you'll see here in a moment, the audio tracks are not watermarked. They're low bit rate in preview mode, but they're not watermarked. So you and your clients and your customers and everything else can get a really good idea of what this is going to sound like when you put it into your timeline. And that's one of the really cool things that we've done, which I'm going to show you right now. So here we have an edit uh, that my uh, young offspring has been working on during quarantine. And uh, I, I'm, I was trying to find some new content that I haven't shown on stream today. So I thought, why not show this? So this is a, a, little, a little movie that he put together, and it's called Jason Voorhees versus Pennywise. Now, there's some dialogue that still needs to be added to this, some voiceover style dialogue. Um, but he wanted to add some kind of creepy soundtrack. And I was going to compose it for him, but again, everything's kind of disjointed at the moment. So let me just play back a little bit of this so you can kind of see what the footage looks like. He shot this entire thing on the iPhone uh, in 4K, and it's uh, an edited in Rush, imported into Premiere. Let's take a quick look. Again, no sound at this point. You'll hear a couple sound effects and things in there, but largely just uh, just video at this point. Also, some motion graphics templates. These wouldn't be my choices, but uh, you know, he's eight, so he can choose what he wants. All right. Not bad for iPhone footage, I gotta say. <laughs> it's a standoff. If we have any fans of Jason and Pennywise. All right. And then if you were watching my uh, Adobe Lives the other What's day. What's going on? Where's my keys? <laughs> Shark puppet imposter because uh, there's just a lot of that as of late around this house. So, OK, you can see how something like this could very nicely lend itself to having a nice, dark, creepy soundtrack. So that's what we're going to do. So up here in the Essential Sound panel, we have tons of options here for how we want to search on stuff. Now, if I simply wanted to check out like the different moods and genres, let's go ahead and twirl this down. We're going to go kind of deep into this because I just think it's worth exploring. And right away, you can see that you have, if you've ever searched for stock audio uh, with these various services, these are sort of standard mood descriptors. So angry, atmospheric, dramatic, dreamy, dynamic, emotional, exotic, festive, gritty. I like those. So again, you can start to choose something that kind of fits the idea, the mood that you're going for. So I don't know, it's kind of creepy, dark, maybe it is sort of angry. So I can click angry. And when I do that, right away, you see it starts filtering the results. So we just lost about 35,000. <laughs> We're down to 1,100 results with, with music that's tagged as angry. Now, dramatic, mm, maybe. Uh, frantic, I like that. I like kind of frantic. All right. Yeah, it went up a bit there. And maybe um, scary. And maybe we'll take angry out of there. I don't know if I need angry. Not so much anger as it is. I like, I like the idea of frantic and scary. OK. Now, on top of the moods, you also have genres. So if you're looking specifically for music that's tagged as angry and scary, but you know, you don't want to return any, I suppose there's angry or uh, um, gritty, scary uh, country music or classical or whatever, you can then further choose the genre that you want to narrow it down to. And you'll see that if you um, twirl out things like electronic, you're going to see a couple of different options here for that. 
Similarly for classical, a lot of options here for classical. All right, if you just cl check classical, I imagine it chooses everything. And then you can see that it really starts to thin out the results here. Pretty cool. So maybe let's start checking out some of the classical options, okay? Because I do want to go for a sort of orchestral, dark, creepy kind of vibe. So let's take a listen. The first one here is called A Feast for a King. And that sounds like that's going to be kind of bright and positive. Ooh, this, we got a Halloween night one here too. That seems pretty cool. Now what's awesome about this is that we have a function here called Timeline Sync. And you'll see, I don't know if you can read the tooltip here, but it says, when enabled, audio previews will play in sync with your timeline from the point where you place the playhead. So because I want this to start at the beginning where we're fading up from black, I've got my playhead right here at the beginning. So when I hit play now, it's going to play this in context, previewing it at the start or wherever I want it to begin. Super cool. This also tells us the tempo here and the full duration of this piece. So let's take a listen to A Feast for a King. Okay, right away, nope. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want that. Uh, I have my own kind of Baroque harpsichord music, not the right choice. Again, you're searching, you're gonna find all different kinds of results. Above C level note, let's go to Halloween night. Feels kind of Halloween-like. Not bad, maybe a little a little happier than I was hoping for, even though it sounds partially in a minor key. Let's try um, let's try under the dome. Right away. Right away I like it. And at this point, I go no further because I know what I was looking for, I know what I heard in my head, and when I actually sang my own soundtrack idea to my son, I was like, does that sound good? And he said, <laughs> actually said, he goes, Dad, it sounds a little like Jaws. You've been watching too much John Will, or listening to too much John Williams. He did say that because we talk a lot about John Williams, very well known. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, that probably is Jaws. I probably did inadvertently kind of, you know, da -da. not exactly that, but I had this kind of slow, almost this exact same style with just, like quarter note, uh, quarter note cellos and strings. So I love this. So now, if I want to sort of temp this in my track, a couple of things I can do here. I can right click on our little ellipses fly out here, and I can choose to add it to the project. Or even easier, you can just take this directly from Adobe Stock and drag it down into an available track. It downloads the preview file, and just like that now it places it right inside the timeline. So we really make this, you know, super effortless in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we construct this and make it work and really get to hear everything that's in there. So now you can see there's like different sections. So maybe we can skip ahead over here and take a listen to this. Now again, I'm not worried about the dialogue mixing at, the, at this moment, but let's kind of listen to what this B section sounds like. What's going on? Where's the keys? <laughs> Cheese. <laughs> it's pretty creepy, right? I'm thinking all I need are some like film stock overlays with scratches and noise and dirt and like a gate weave. This is gonna look great. And he's eight, you know, so he'll think it's awesome, right? Even if some of us are played out on the eight millimeter film stock stuff, I think it's gonna really sell the idea here. So if I wanted to license this track at this point, again, a couple of different ways to do it. You can of course license directly from the Adobe Stock panel. You see your little shopping cart here, click on license, or just as with your images in Photoshop or images that you're working with in InDesign or any other Adobe app, you can right click, control click here and choose license. Now, let's just say, for argument's sake, that we had applied some effects to this, because again, as a soundtrack, maybe we're just gonna add a little bit of limiting or compression to this. Maybe some EQ, again, to kind of scoop out some space for dialogue. Anything that we did to it would remain. 
So we wouldn't lose any of the processing, just like with images, right? You can download a stock image that's watermarked. You can color correct it, grade it, do whatever, same for stock video. And then if you get the sign off, you can license it and all the things that you've done to it remain. So this is super awesome. So let's go ahead and license this one. All right. And it's going to give us a little dialogue here, which is going to say, do you want to license under the dome? Yes, it's going to use one of my available credits. Go ahead and confirm. All right, now if you're paying attention to the waveform, you'll see momentarily that it'll, it'll blink and it'll change from a preview M4A to a WAV file. Right now it's downloading the uh, master file in the background. But what's important to note here too, that if you're going to be publishing this to a place like YouTube or, or Facebook or anywhere, um, you're going to want to copy off this license code. Now, by the way, you can also access these license codes directly from your uh, stock.adobe.com account. If you go into you know, your options or settings you know, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a thing to see, you know, licenses, and you'll find all of these in there for any associated audio that you download and license. What this is for specifically, if you manage to publish this to YouTube and you wind up getting a, a copyright notice, okay? Now, I've done this now, um, did I say the other day, about a dozen times? I haven't hit it yet. Now, it could be that some of these files haven't made it into their content ID system quite yet. The point is you're covered, okay? You have licensed this. So if you were to get that message, now it's not a strike message, but you've seen these messages before, you can defend, you know, defend it saying, yes, I have the license. There's quite a few click throughs to go through there, but this is the code that you ultimately paste to prove that you have the proper license to be using this synchronized to picture on YouTube and you're good to go. Now, again, I haven't personally run into this yet. So it could just be that I got lucky or found some tracks that haven't yet um, worked their way into the um, into the uh, uh, the content ID system for YouTube. But either way, you have access to those. Okay, pretty sweet. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna just uh, let's shrink this one up. And why don't we uncheck this for a moment? Now those are some classical options here. I mean, I guess that's kind of what I was thinking of. I wonder if I go to film now, how it differs, how it's possibly different. So I'm gonna mute that track right there. Okay, oh, that's weird. Now, why isn't it showing me? Interesting, not seeing it licensed in there. It's just not updating the thumbnail. Like it. Okay, so let's take uh, another listen to something else here. So now we're in film stock. Oh, and here I'm going to go and see Bob Demers, very Tim Burton. The first two weren't very scary at all, and not frantic. Yeah, exactly. Right, and that's you know, I mean, I, I I've had these arguments too. You know, with mood in particular, mm, kind of. I don't know that it's it is sort of subjective, and because you can see what it's showing you is the other tags that are in these tracks. So this one is film, all right? And that's that's a, the only thing I have selected now, right? Yeah, this is film, but it's also mood-wise, playful, dynamic, background, drones, oh, drones, um, you know, epic, happy, sad, background. So again, sometimes people, you know, it's just how the composer identified these and combined them. So I'm, I'm with you. I wouldn't have given either one of those scary or frantic, but that's okay, but this that last one definitely was. All right, so let's check out this one here, Paranormal Activities. That sounds kind of neat. Another winner. First try. Oh, I don't even have to hear it anymore. I just love it. It's kind of ominous, right? In fact, I was just noticing it says zero BPM because clearly, yeah, there's no percussion. Oh, I love this. Absolutely. This one's a done deal. So again, I can just go ahead and license this. Doing all of this, knowing that I will ultimately replace these and compose it myself. I'm like I'm wasting credits now, but that's okay. Go ahead and confirm it. All right. There's our license code again. 
it downloads. Okay, and now to do it the other way, if I were in this case to uh, download, I can just click the little download button here and uh, we can download it to the desktop. Or again, I can add this to the project, saving it to a library. In this case, I always put these things in my JSON's library and it just did that. Now, we're gonna get to libraries in a little bit, but just to kind of showcase what just happened there, let me pull up the libraries panel here and we're gonna go into audio. All right. And now what you see, this is what is so cool, is in this audio tab now, first of all, you can see some of the previews of previous tracks that I've auditioned from Adobe Stock, okay? So this is showing you here, it's showing you, you know, by whom it was created, the tempo, the time. And then here's some of the ones that I've licensed, okay? Including Under the Dome, there's the one that we just just downloaded, 40 megs there, and uh, Paranormal Activities, okay? So all of that now is stored under the audio tab in Adobe Stock. Super, super cool. Now you'll also probably be wondering, well, can I put my own audio in there? And the answer to that is yes. And I'm gonna show you that in a couple of moments where I'm gonna export something out of Audition and show you. We'll get back to that. But so this is a super cool way now to, again, we're already storing your brushes. We're already storing your favorite colors, graphics, videos, objects, motion graphics templates. Now audio is just one more part of Adobe Stock, all right? It has a delightful drippy boiler room feel. <laughs> Very descriptive, creepy, and perfect. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Tim, I happen to know someone who does a killer ghost Robert De Niro impression. Very, very good. All right. Uh, Paloma, that first one gave me Robin Hood vibes, right? With the harpsichord. I know. I love, don't get me wrong, I love a harpsichord. You know, I'm all about it. I, I love playing them, as a matter of fact. Uh, last time I got an opportunity, a friend of mine, his dad collects old keyboard instruments um, up in uh, Uppsala in Sweden, and he had, um, uh, did he have a harpsichord and a clavichord? Now I'm forgetting. Either way, they're very close. Um, plucked, right? Plucked keyboard instruments. So there's no dynamics on a harpsichord or clavichord. Uh, and they always feel very kind of fragile to me. But gosh, it's amazing to play a real one. And these were restored, you know, 17th century models or 18th century models. Not, not quite as old as I would have liked. <laughs> no, they're amazing. Um, okay, so stock audio, searching. Now I want to just point out here, since we've already done kind of moods, and genre, one of the other um, search criteria that you have available to you, I'll leave the film genre in here for now, um, but it's tempo and duration. So this is also really cool because now that last track that I licensed was only um, a minute 10. This piece is about a minute 40. So all that means is I'd either have to loop a little section of it re-add a section. I mean, that's the nice thing is there's no tempo, there's no pulse. So I could just do a crossfade somewhere in the middle, extending the length, and you, and you, you wouldn't hear it. You wouldn't perceive it as weird. Um, that would totally work, especially if you're going to have other sound design and things going on. It would be very, very seamless. But you can search on specific durations. So let's say that, you know, I want something that is at a, at a minimum, you know, a minute 10, and then, you know, the maximum doesn't really matter. So we could leave it up to 20. But now when I look through here, uh, again, now you're only seeing tracks that have a minimum duration of one minute and 10 seconds. So this is great because, you know, if you're looking to not have to do any editing, if you're looking to not have to extend something or do any of that kind of work, you can do it by searching on specific durations. Now, similarly, you also have tempo options. Now, this was something I showed earlier this week where I had um, this Alaska video for this uh, TV show that I was cutting together. And the original scored soundtrack that I used was done at 145 BPM. So I actually wanted to find stuff that was 145 BPM because I had cut my original trailer to 145 BPM soundtrack which meant that when I grabbed something from stock that was 145 BPM, the cuts were in time because the tempo was the same. I even found a couple tracks that were within a few BPM, 140, 142, and they still worked, you know, 
Um, it was it was awesome. I mean, I was a little shocked that it worked so well, that it looked so good. So you can also search on tempo. You know, if you're doing something and you want really super fast, frantic, you know, I don't want anything below 140 then it's going to find stuff for you, right? And just like that, you can see down here now. Now, these are, again, we're kind of in that classical zone, but you can see it's finding stuff. I wonder what this Farewell Brave Friend one sounds like. I'm just curious. It's probably kind of epic-y sounding, but, oh, it is. There, it says epic. All right, let's take a listen. Yeah, happy, though. That's the problem, right? <laughs> Happy and Pennywise Jason Voorhees don't usually go hand in hand. Oh, but creepy haunted atmosphere. Now, this is 145. Yeah, I mean, you just can't lose with dark, ominous synth pads, right? I like it. Let's add it to the project. I'm just going to grab that preview. <laughs> Sometimes you combine all three, you know? Does anybody know the composer who very famously did that and listened to multiple types of music simultaneously? I'll leave that out there for the chat. <clears throat> okay. Can we add marks or annotations to pieces in the Adobe stock list? That is an awesome feature request. Currently, no. So um, that's something really awesome. Now, again, this is, this is V1. This is the first variation of this, first version of this that we've released. That would be great, because I, I, I agree. I, I would probably like to put some notes. You know, the option that you do have, of course, is that you could do that inside of Premiere, because whatever you preview gets stored here. So you could, you could do that here. You could also add it to the metadata uh, descriptions of the files here as well. Not fully ideal, but that's, that's a sort of workaround way to do it if that was something you were interested in. All right? Very cool. I love harpsichords. The black keys make my hands look good. Yeah, I mean, it's so cool to have the reverse keys, too. I, I, I would want one. One, because of the just they're awesome. But two, I do. I, the old school, the reverse keyboard looks so, so neat. Uh, Paloma, ooh, OK. All right, so again, um, tempo, duration. And then we also have with vocal, no vocal. So this is particularly cool if, again, you're searching on content that you want that has that kind of cinematic epic feel. I always think of Lord of the Rings or even Harry Potter or something. You know, if you search on film, epic, has vocals, you're going to find a lot of the stuff that has choirs and everything else in it, which unless you have uh, a native instruments library with really good choirs, or you just happen to know a local choir that you can record very easily, it's sort of hard to come by, right? So it's a very cool way to search for that kind of stuff. For something like this, I'd probably go no vocals. Although when I think about creepy soundtracks, my favorite one of all time, Dirty Harry, 1971 by Lalo Schifrin. And it has that very, very famous, very infamous solo female voice, heavily reverberated doing the uh, You hear some creepy synth pads playing a minor second. So very dissonant. And then some very groovy, slick, sneaky sounding drums come in and a very groovy picked bass guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to be transported to 1971, please, right now. OK. Can you pop the temp tracks into Audition to edit them? Yes, you can. And that's actually a fantastic segue to the next bit here that I was going to show. Bob, so thank you for leading me into that. Didn't even know you were doing it, but you did. <laughs> OK. All right, so let me go ahead and uh, let me grab this under the dome. And instead of just sending the audio file by itself, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to save this. And I'm just, I, just, I figured I would show this, because we were talking about this internally this week, and it's really cool. I'm going to quickly send the whole sequence over. Now, normally, I could, pr I could really just do this in Audition by itself. Um, I'm struggling whether I want to show you the full way or not. I'm going to show you the full way. I'm going to send the whole sequence over. All right. And we'll call this Jason Penny Temp Edit. All right. Uh, I'm going to do this via Dynamic Link. So I'm going to send the entire sequence. I'll send video through Dynamic Link. I don't have any clip effects or track effects, but we'll just leave that. Pan and volume information, we're going to leave that open in Audition. And let's go ahead and click OK. 
And what this is going to do is it's going to send the entire sequence over to Audition and reassemble it there so now that we can do a number of things. Now, if I just wanted to edit the audio file itself, again, adjust length, do whatever. Um, oh, time remapping. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I could do that. In this case, why I'm bringing everything over is because I wanted to show you a function in Audition which we've had for a long time, not everybody is intimately aware of, and it's called Remix. And Remix is going to allow us to automatically readjust or dynamically recompose this audio. So, and I want to clarify something here because this again came up internally. It's called, the feature's called Remix, and it's something that you access uh, via properties or the Essential Sound Panel. Just for clarification, because one of the things that you'll notice in the licenses for Adobe Stock Audio is that you're not technically allowed to remix the audio. Remix in the more traditional audio engineer definition, which is, you know, if you had all the stems, for instance, if you downloaded the same track from Epidemic, you can get all the stems from it. You're not allowed to go in and remix everything, add new vocals, add a new B section, overdub something else, and then put it out and then like resell it as your own music. You can't do that. You can't do that full stop. Here, remix is more of what my colleague uh, Duran referred to years ago as dynamic recomposition. All it's really doing is re-editing sections for you so that you don't have to do it to fit a specific duration, okay? So let me go ahead and pull up my properties panel here. All right, let's unmute this. Here we go, let's, oh, we can keep properties right there. I think you can see it. Okay, yeah, here, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. And let's go into the remix setting right here, okay? And let's click on enable remix. Now what that's going to do is it's analyzing the clip duration. So it's figuring out everything it needs to know and it's trying to identify if there's a pulse where there are edit, you know, where, where there are suitable edit points. Okay, now I can't remember, does this one have uh, percussion? I guess they didn't have any keys. Subscribe and like this video and click that notification button. <laughs> okay. It, uh, it has some pulse, but it doesn't really have a consistent pulse. So this may be interesting how it's going to remix or dynamically recompose this, but let's see, let's see what it does. So first and foremost, you're going to notice that you have this option here for target duration. So you can hover scrub over this to set the target duration, or if you grab the upper right-hand corner of the audio file itself, here in the timeline and make sure that it says remix as opposed to grabbing the fade, okay? You notice the tool changes. I'll zoom in so you can see that again. This is also where you can find things like clip time stretching, okay? Let's go ahead and with remix, snap this to the end. And what you're gonna see is it reconfigures the audio, but now, we get these little wiggly lines, and these wiggly lines represent non-destructive cross-faded edit points. And now you can see that it fits the duration perfectly, even through the little fade out right here, okay? Super, super awesome. So if we were to play this now, and we can listen through these little edits. Okay, that was a phenomenal edit right there. Totally seamless. Nicely done. All right, let's listen to this one here. Nice. What? Yes. Now, we didn't even adjust any of the various parameters. You'll see here that you have many. You have edit length. So do you want the edits to be longer or shorter? In this case, the default is longer edits. So it just found two good points so that it could keep the beginning and the end of the track and then edit stuff in the middle to fit it. You then can feature more on the harmonic side of things or the, um, the timbral side of things. You have a minimum loop duration, which here 
kind of applies. That works really well if you've got really beat-based music. You know, I don't just mean EDM, but anything that has a consistent rhythm, you can say, okay, the minimum loopable section, editable section, it's got to be at least eight beats long. And because most of this audio is usually in 4-4 time, that's about two bars worth of music. So you can set a minimum loop and then maximum slack, okay? Because obviously it's going to try and fit it in perfectly, but there might be, you know, again, if there's a fade out at the end, it's, it's, going, you're, it's going to kind of give you a little bit of headroom. Think of it like having handles at the end. So you can say, I want five or 10, I think five is the minimum actually. Yeah, five or up to, is it 60? 30 seconds of slack at the end so that you can kind of play around with, maybe that's where credits will go, or if, if you're thinking about YouTube videos, your title cards, title cards, end cards, right? Maybe it's kind of over a black screen or over a still frame. So you can set the amount of slack that's used. Now, if we instead said stretch to exact duration, this will do just that. It will make it exactly, so you can see here, we had about two seconds worth, two and a half seconds worth of slack, okay? That's what it wound up using. Um, the actual duration is 119, okay? If you said stretch to exact duration, it will do just that. The difference is now, what it's doing is it's using our stretching algorithm, okay? So ultimately, if I, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn this on just for a second here. When you do that, um, and you'll notice now it's snapped right to the edge, so there's no hangover, okay? It's using the stretching algorithm. So what you might incur, it doesn't look, it's hard to tell here, you might get some audio artifacting. So if I just listen to this back real quickly. We may have gotten lucky with this one. I don't really hear any artifacting. Depending upon the type of music, sometimes, again, it's, it's, it's actually stretching it as opposed to cutting it up as well. I mean, it's cutting it as well, but it's also stretching to fit. So you, you might end up with some slightly smeared transients. That's an industry term. It is not perverse, I promise you. Smeared transients um, in portions, but let's take a listen here. <laughs> have any cheese. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Subscribe and like this video and click the Now I'm hearing a little bit of this sounds almost a little gurgly. So it sounds like we are hearing a little bit of artifacting right there. So that's the difference with hitting that stretch function. Let me just, let me play this back again. No gurgling. So again, in the sort of more sparse sections, not really audible here, where there's a lot of dynamic information happening, a lot of instruments playing simultaneously, a lot of transient attacks and symbols and everything. It's kind of smearing some of that. So, you know, in this case, stretch to exact wasn't the ideal way to do it. We used about two seconds of slack here at the end. It still is going to work out perfectly. And now we have our edit. So if we now wanted to send just this soundtrack back to Premiere, we can come up to multi-track here. Notice I have the original dialogue uh, muted. Let's go ahead and export to Adobe Premiere Pro. I'll call this, uh, let's call this the Penny Jason Sund track UTD under the dome remixed. All right. I don't know if that's where I want it to go. That's not where I want it to go. I want it to go into this folder here. It's 441. Okay. And we're going to mix it down as stereo and we're going to open it in Premiere and we're going to click export. All right, and now it says, where do you want it to go? Copy to the active sequence, new audio track, sounds good to me, or we could stick it on audio three since there's nothing there. Go ahead and do that, click okay. There it is, and notice, right? Now it's the correct duration with our little bit of slack at the end there. Go ahead and play it back. <laughs> Really, 
really nicely done, okay? So that was an enormous amount of time spent on, uh, on stock audio, but I think it's worth it because there's a lot of stuff that you can explore in here. By the way, it's also pointing out that if you only want to see Epidemic provided soundtracks, you can do that. Or if you want to see just Gemendo, you can do that as well. And you'll see it'll just kind of minimize those results, okay? Now, in terms of adding audio to the library's panel, let me just show you real quickly how that's done. So I'm going to come back over to our audition session. And I want to find this little scream, this right there of our little friend here. <laughs> All right. I can't tell you how much joy it gives me when he does that sound. <laughs> I don't know if that's weird. I don't know if that's like proud dad or something. I, I don't know how it's proud dad. It just, it just cracks me up to no end. Okay, so I'm going to save this out as shark imposter scream. And I'm going to stick it on the desktop, all right? And you'll see why in just a second, okay? Save it as wave and click OK. All right. So let me go back to Premiere Pro. And I'm just going to shrink our UI here for a second. Okay. How do you bring audio into the, the library's panel? All right. You have to currently drag it from the desktop or the Explorer, okay? It would make sense that you'd be able to drag from Premiere directly into the audio tab. You can't do that just yet. This just got added a few months ago, so this is still new. We hear you. I believe it's already a feature request to be able to do it from within the app. But just to kind of reiterate here, it's now done via the desktop. So I can take this shark imposter screen because this is something I know I'm going to want to use. He does a lot of shark puppet videos. So I'm going to drag this right into the library. And just like that, you can see it's now uploading and it's there and it's done just like that. Okay. So if I wanted to add more screams, again, I can just click and drag and bring this right down into the timeline down here. Or no, sorry, I have to add it to the project first. Yes, my, my, my mistake. Add it to the project, and then, of course, I can drag it in. All right, so we could stick it right here if we wanted, just because it just makes me so very happy. <laughs> OK, so that's how you add audio to um, uh, CC libraries. OK, we've got uh, 13 minutes to go here, so I'm just going to check on our chats. The Prince of Screams, yes. Cullen Brooks, what's up? Yes, every Friday at uh, 1030 Pacific. All right. Cal, I can't get over how mostly great the auto-generated stuff in Premiere is. Yes, I would agree. And that's the nice thing. I mean, a lot of this stuff shocks you. And I'm the first to say, you've heard me say it on streams before. Auto, uh, yeah, I, I'm usually very skeptical with auto anything as most of us are, you know, whether it's photography, you know, when, when we did the revised auto in Lightroom CC, I was like, yeah, okay, but is it really good? It's really good, right? Part of it, because it's one, it's Sensei. Two, it's going out to the web and it's looking at similar images and things, trying to look at color and light and hue and everything else, and then returning a result that makes sense versus just like looking at the one image and going, all right, well, it doesn't matter if it's landscape or portrait or blah, this needs to be brighter, this needs to have shadows lifted, this, you know, Again, stylistically, that may not be common for the type of image you're shooting. So now there's intelligence behind it. And that's what you're going to find with a lot of these automated functions um, across all the Adobe apps. Where there's Sensei, there's some real intelligence happening there, and the results are just generally better. But also, overall, the way that they're using new algorithms today, they're just, yeah, the results just, they're generally a good starting point, even if it's not exactly what you want. So I love that comment. Nice. Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. So if there are several tracks I'm considering for my edit, my only option is to download the trails to my timeline and play around. Yeah, I mean, you can download as many of the previews as you want. Now, again, if you want the full, uh, you know, full bit depth, full, full um, uncompressed version, then you license. But sure, you can, you can do any number of those. Love Lalo Schifrin. Yes. All right. Very cool. <laughs> change the colors of the apps back. I did see someone on the uh, the interwebs, you know, they, they now have a, a it's very easy to uh, to change out the icons if you so desire. I don't recommend that, but I happen to really like them. I really, they've really grown on me. And the reason it's grown on me is because now 
it's grouped by, by discipline, right? So sort of all the video and audio motion stuff all has kind of its theme color. The design stuff has its theme color. UI, UX, its theme. Illustrator didn't really change, which is kind of a nice thing in the middle of it all. And then you have, you know, things like services that are in that kind of black and white uh, monochrome look. I, I know it's hard to get used to initially, but I really, I, they've started to grow on me a lot. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do here, um, again, around some stock stuff uh, is essential graphics. Uh, and I can show you a little bit of video as well, but specifically for those of you unfamiliar, um, motion graphics templates are, again, all these things that you're seeing on screen here, including, let me just mute this, not only these little, oh, sorry, I've got the music down here. Not only these animated kind of glitchy titles, but if we go towards the end again here, so you can see I've got this animated like button, he's got the animated subscribe button, and the animated notification button. All of these graphics are motion graphics templates. These were created, these in fact, were created in Premiere. You can also create these in After Effects. And then that's what you're getting when you look inside of Adobe Stock is animated social callouts, social animations, lower thirds, backgrounds, transitional elements, all kind, really anything that you can do with text and stuff that you would use regularly, that's the kind of stuff you're gonna see here. And these are updated all the time. So every time I go back into Adobe Stock under Essential Graphics, there's always something new to look at. So like right here, this word cloud, fade in, and 3D fly in. So um, sometimes it takes a second for these things to cache, but these are hover scrubbable, meaning that before you, um, if I click on the little I button, may, oh, maybe these aren't animated. Oh, there it is, okay. So it just took a second for it to cache. So this is kind of showing you what it does in terms of how it's animating. This is like a text animation, obviously, right? So you can see it's kind of doing this really simple kind of pseudo fly-in, 3D fly-in. This actually just looks like a modified version of our classic After Effects 3D text fly-in. But it's really nice. Tells you the fonts, tells you how many styles, lots of keywording there. This is a new one too. Black and white paper tear titles. Okay, super cool. Oh, check this out. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see these better. Now again, we have some of the, you know, the best motion designers out there building these things. Oh, that's super, super cool. Look at that with like the trajectory. Oh, I love that. I love that style. And look, it's got some like animation going on in the upper corners there. All right, here's a, another, another diagonal tear variation. Oh, this is super cool. Really, really nice. All right, now this is a premium one. This is a paid one, it's 10 seconds. Look at the file size, it's nothing. Tells you the font. This indicator here, all that means is if you don't have this font as of sans Uber already installed, it will just license it for you because it's an Adobe font font, <laughs> formerly Typekit. That was easier to say when we called them Typekit. So again, all of the motion graphics templates that are in the Adobe Stock Marketplace are leveraging Adobe fonts because that way they will display properly wherever you are on any system, regardless of whether you have them licensed or installed or not. It'll do it for you. Super cool. First question I always get asked is, well, if I'm building my own, can I use a non-Adobe font? And the answer is, of course. The difference is that if you share that with someone, either as a file, a .mogert, or via a shared CC library, that user has to have that font installed if it's a non-Adobe font, okay? I too, there's a couple of that, that company, My Fonts. I've bought a few random ones that are not, they're just not part of Adobe Fonts. That family is not part of Adobe Fonts. We have over 17,000 plus fonts in Adobe Fonts, but there's a few that, you know, <laughs> I couldn't get. So I got, I bought them elsewhere. Um, I can build Mogrids with them, but if I'm gonna share them with somebody, they need to have that licensed font as well, okay? Anyhow, so again, you can search through these things. So again, by default here, we're just seeing kind of some new stuff. You notice that you have these free and premium buttons. These are super, super awesome. If you click on free, this is once again going to allow you to see the kind of stuff that's been recently added. So obviously there's a lot of July 4th related titles. You've also got this zoom bar here so you can kind of zoom out a bit and see more on screen. All right, pretty cool stuff. So here, let's see what this one looks like. If I were doing a, uh, something around July 4th. Oh yeah, I mean, look at that. 
and I tell people this all the time, you know, I'm really comfortable working in After Effects, but I have two major limitations. One is I'm just kind of slow doing it. And three, I am not, I suck at design. So like, could I remake this? It's, it's flat. It's just flat with like fake drop shadows. Sure, really simple animations. Totally just tweened animations. The smoke looks pretty cool there. But I mean, it, it would take me forever to make something like this and it would never stylistically look as cool, even if this isn't your thing. Um, really nicely done, right? So again, this is free. What? This is free. So tells you it's 1080p. There's two different styles, custom colors, custom font selection really nice. And here's the, the font that it's using, Postino Standard Italic. So hold on, I'm just going to save a version of this real quickly. 01A, we'll come back to my productions thing that we did the other day. Bob, can you share review versions with the temp tracks? Um, yes, I don't see why not. Absolutely. Right. Now, obviously, you know, as a good citizen, would you want to publish unlicensed temp tracks? Probably not. Now, again, you would get, ultimately, it, there's a very good chance that you might get that copyright flag at that point. So if you were trying to monetize, even if it's not licensed, um, YouTube is probably going to step in there and you won't have the code because you haven't licensed it yet. Makes sense, right? But as far as, yeah, sharing and whatnot, sure. If you're doing an edit, you want people to see it, sure, include the music. Okay. Uh... Okay, checking. All right, nothing else there. Stephanie finally got Photoshop fixed today, now updating Mac to latest performance. But Oh, nice. Yeah, Stephanie, I remember you were talking about that the other day, that you were uh, having some Photoshop, Photoshop moments that weren't ideal. So I'm glad to hear it's back to normal. So just to kind of show you, because we've only got three more minutes here, let's go back and I'll just, um, let's go ahead and drag, drag this in. This is, again, going to look pretty bizarre going over top of um, Jason, but why not? All right. So it's loading the template in here. Probably be good to use this as kind of a transitional element somewhere. Okay. Now, again, depending upon what's inside of this thing, this may take a moment to, uh, to load. This one seems to be taking a, uh, taking a, a minute here. Um, also, remember that these can be created in After Effects. So I just want to show you that real quickly. Oh, there we go. All right, see, progress bar didn't really indicate properly what was happening there. Um, oh, there we go. Let's go ahead and click on this. So this was very clearly created in After Effects. All right. Um, and I know that for by two three two indicators one you have these separators so this is something that we added in after effects um, a couple of versions ago where inside of its essential graphics panel you can add you can group things together so you can see here like at the top we have our global controls so we can switch between version one and version two right there were two versions of this uh of this animation now much like with after effects um, as you scrub through the content, the motion graphics template, it will cache those frames and you'll start to see it in real time. This applies to only the After Effects generated motion graphics templates, right? Because After Effects right now, it's not a real time app. You have to, you have to go into preview mode to cache those frames to be able to see this stuff like this that's animated play back. So once you start to do that, once you scrub through, you'll see it's eventually going to go into real time because it's caching those frames accordingly. All right. So you can see we can change that. We can change the size. That's really cool, actually. You can change the global position. So again, these are the global controls. Let's go back to version one here with the, with the hot dogs. All right. Look at that. Ah, so cool. Really kind of gives you a good idea. All right. And then furthermore, of course, you have your text options here. Again, I know that this is done in After Effects because when you enable text editing in After Effects for motion graphics templates, this is what it looks like. So right now it's in Postino. Again, we can change this to something else if we want. You know, instead of main title, Jason V Pennywise. Okay. And it should take that in there. And there we go. 
right? <laughs> and the hot dogs go right below it. You can change the text color, the shadow color. Here's our second line of text. You get the idea, okay? And then you have your style controls, which is all the various colors of this template. So just an enormous amount of flexibility with these. And then again, just to kind of reiterate here in After Effects, this is the essential graphics panel. So if we started to build our own thing, all right, so let's just make a new comp and we'll call this Tezd Anim, okay? And we can take the text tool here and we're just gonna drop some text in here. Hello, all right. And I'm just going to align this like that, okay? And we can take the text here and we can drag the source text up into the essential graphics panel, all right? Now you can see you have edit options, edit properties. And in those edit properties, I can say enable font adjustment. Click OK, all right? Or I can go into font adjustment, custom font, and faux styles. And you'll see it's going to give us that exact same UI that it gave us over here in Premiere for text, OK? So essential graphics, you can save them out of After Effects, bring them into Premiere, but my friends, that is all the time we have. So thank you so much for joining. We've got the uh, Daily Creative Challenge for Illustrator coming up next. So until then, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Happy July 4th for those of us in the US next week, and I'll see you again in about 10 days or so. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.